Uh, do you want me to just launch into it then? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about kind of listening um, and really uh, listening as a compositional practice, but kind of how I got to a place where, um, you know, I think of my primary mode of making music is actually listening more than it is writing. Um, and this all started, you know, before I even actually jump into listening, I want to talk a little bit very briefly about photography and kind of, um, I've always loved photography, I've always dabbled in photography, but I'm by no means a trained photographer. And so I know a little bit about aperture and shutter speed and all the things that you're supposed to know, but I don't really know the technique, I don't really know the craft in the way that I know music, um, but I do enjoy it and I really love taking photos and people have told me that at least some of my photos are beautiful. And that's very nice and kind to hear, but it's gotten me thinking like, well, what, like why, like how does that even work? Like if I don't know these techniques and these craft of being a photographer, like what is it that is photography then? Like what is it that I'm actually doing? Cause it's gotta be more than just like clicking the button. And it eventually occurred to me that photography is really just a way of seeing, of seeing the world of capturing these little moments, um, often with my phone more than a regular camera. Um, but trying to capture these little moments of beauty and then sharing them. And that kind of led me to this place where I often find myself, especially post-masters, which I think is interesting, um, where I kind of ask myself ridiculously dumb questions about music that also end up being kind of profound in their naivete. Um, and one of those questions that I constantly ask myself is sort of like, well, what is listening? And it seems really simple and almost silly, um, but it also strikes me as kind of like really important. Like, what is it that we're all doing here? Um, and so I go back and I think about like, you know, how I first started approaching music. Um, when I was a young person, you know, I remember going to the orchestra as a kid uh, and never having been there before, never having been exposed to that music and like wanting to make sure that I was hearing what I was supposed to be hearing and like, is what I'm hearing what everyone else is hearing? And, you know, there's just so much going on and it was so unfamiliar and new to me. Like, what is it that I'm supposed to be listening for? What is it that everyone else is listening to? Like, what am I supposed to be getting out of this music? And some of that definitely came from like a place of insecurity, right? Sort of like wanting to be in the in crowd. Um, but I think, you know, it leads to more interesting questions the more you sort of just ruminate, meditate on it. And then eventually, you know, I get to a place where I start to think about, uh, you know, though when I was at the orchestra, it was always, you know, capital R romantic pieces, your Beethoven, your Brahms, et cetera. Um, music that's got sort of a much clearer, much clearer uh, sense of intention and purpose. Um, but then I start to think about, you know, as I got older, you listen to music like Steve Reich um, and this pattern music where you can focus on the pattern being created. I think a lot about like the opening of drumming um, and there's that pattern that's created slowly over time, but then there's the resulting pattern of the echo of that pattern. And you can start to decide as a listener, you can, you know, to bring back the photography metaphor, you can zoom in and out of focus as to which one you're listening to at any given moment. And, you know, the music forces the listener to create the music themselves from the resulting patterns and sort of what they choose to focus on. And I think about that a lot in the context of people I know who don't necessarily like that kind of music um and in my opinion that you know not liking it or you know not having strong feelings towards it comes from almost not knowing what it's offering or what it's possible to listen to or what you're supposed to be listening to it's so divergent from kind of what you know a lay listener would be exposed to just in in the world in and on this earth of ours um, and it gets me to this place uh, where I think about the power of listening with open ears um, and how it's really incumbent upon us as listeners to approach music with open ears. Uh, there's a quote, there's a movie called Untitled, came out like 10, 11 years ago. And it's this really hilarious parody of uh, sort of contemporary art and contemporary music. And it takes place in New York City. David Lang wrote the score. 
Um, it's this really hilarious send up. But the main character is a composer and he's this experimental composer who's like obsessed with weird sounds and nobody comes to his concerts and is, you know, it's this very funny character. And he plays piano at a bar to make money. And, you know, someone asks him like, why don't you just play music like this? Um, you know, and then you can become rich and wealthy, you know, kind of the joke of the film. And he talks about, there's a quote that's always stuck with me from that movie, which is, uh, Beethoven can be considered noise if it's not wanted. And so I sit and I think about that, like, what does that mean for me? You know, composers are often asked the question, like, who are you writing for? And I'm writing for the listener with open ears. And I try really hard to be the listener with open ears because we've all been in that situation where Beethoven is noise, but we can also be in a situation where noise can become music. And like, that's the, the threshold that I'm always wondering is that, you know, sort of that line between noise and music and what is it? And, you know, that's the material I like to work with. And I think about how, being an open listener has affected my understanding of contemporary music and new music. Um, I had, I was a professor this past semester at Syracuse University, and I was working with sophomores who were being exposed to 20th and 21st century music, uh, many of them for the first time. And I always, always started any kind of listening example with this sentence, which was, you know, don't, if you go into this music expecting something that you get from other music from it, you're going to be disappointed. You're not going to like it. But if you come into this music with open ears, you know, and you let this music offer to you what it has to offer to you, you might find something rewarding therein. And I think we've all been in that situation. We all know that feeling, you know, when you're a teenager, there's the rock band you listen to because they just, capture how it feels to be a teenager in that moment and you wear those records out or in my case you wear those mp3s out and you know that's one way of listening and sort of like where you're taking it and you go into a song wanting something from it what i'm proposing um especially for composers but for all listeners is that, is this idea of listening with open ears um listening without expectation and allowing music to offer what it has to say. And so there's a book I read when I was 18. Um, I was a freshman at SUNY Fredonia and I took this class on free improvisation and he assigned this book called The Listening Book by a composer named W.A. Machu. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm terrible at pronouncing French names. Um, but it's one of those books that when I was 18, you know, the way an 18 year old can only love something sort of like all obsessively, it just felt right and made so much sense. And I've been looking back at that book because I've started using it to teach with one of my private students. And revisiting that book, I can see how 10, 12 years later, 14 years later, 14 years later, you know, this book has still had an impact on my life. Um, and so the quote just from the intro of the book uh, that I think sums up what I'm talking about in a really important way uh, is this. Um, there's a problem around our ears, around listening, around music. Listening is receptive. You allow something outside your body to come inside, into your deep brain, into your private of privates. To listen is to be vulnerable, to be open, to be impressionable, to hear everything is dangerous. You can be damaged all too easily. But if you are shut tight against the world, you cannot receive nourishment. The problem is how to be open enough and safe enough at the same time. The resolution is a matter of balance, of discriminating between receptivity and self-defense. Listening can be a way of life. And listening shows how life can become musical to the awakened ear. If you want it, listening will guide you to your own music. And there's one other quote that I think about constantly. Uh, and it's by the American composer, John Luther Adams. He did an interview with the New Yorker, again, probably 10, 12 years ago. 
Um, and there's a video that accompanied it in which he just sat on a rock and listened to the world around him. And often we're asked the question, you know, how far can we see? You climb a big mountain, how far can you see? What's the view? What John Luther Adams asks is how far can we hear? How far can we listen? One of my favorite exercises is to take 30 seconds, a minute, and pause and just see how far we can listen. And if you're listening to me right now, I'm gonna stop talking for a moment so that we can all do this together. Take the next few seconds, next 30 seconds or so. What can you hear now that you weren't hearing before? What are you listening to now that you weren't listening to before? So ultimately all of this leads up to what I've titled the lecture in my head, listening as an act of composition. Uh, I had a really profound shift in my music about five years ago. Um, I started working on this piece that eventually became uh, the work From Dreams We Emerge. And it was my first piece that I was writing in Pro Tools. Uh, it's with electronics. And rather than notating the music first, I just performed the music into Pro Tools um, with the electronics landscape that was happening in the piece. And immediately my music became simpler. Immediately the space became more the pacing became slower, ideas had a longer time to gestate. Um, I was less rushed. I just let the music be, and because I was listening to it, I was able to get the feedback of what an audience member might hear. Whereas up to that point, I had been notating my music on paper or on you know, finale, as it were, and that compositional process, for me at least, was much more about what I could see filling in the paper. And so listening becomes an act of composition. It allows me to work more intuitively, to work with sounds without worrying about notation necessarily, and finding the music uh, and letting the music guide me so that I become, you know, I am the composer of the piece, but I'm also this vessel for the piece and I'm listening as much as I'm composing and I'm hearing uh, where the piece wants to go as much, if not much more, than I'm uh, putting my will onto that piece. So when I think about photography, I think about seeing. When I think about writing music, I think about listening. Okay, so um, I, I could ask you a few questions, as I always do. Um, so, I mean, obviously you, um, one of the things that you, I think one of the things that's quite interesting is you spoke about listening and um, learning to listen. And you also spoke about exposing younger students, relatively young students to um, new music and new ideas. Um, so how do you, do you, you must receive some resistance there. And you, you touched on it a little bit, but how do you, a deal with pe the students' resistances because even after saying all this, some students must be resistant to the, these new ideas. Because um, you know, why wouldn't they be? Because they're they're new, they're different, and you know, they're also kind of unpopular relatively. Um, so how how do you um, how do you approach these new students who might be like, well, I I just don't get it. Uh, they they you can tell that it's not a point. They're not making a judgment about whether they like it or dislike it almost, then they're just completely resistant to the idea. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, some of it is, you know, I'm kind of affable and make jokes sort of leading into these things. So like creating an atmosphere where it's okay to not like something um, is I think really important. Like uh, I used to work in an elementary school where I worked with young people who had like zero exposure to any classical music, let alone contemporary classical music. 
and I would play them stuff. And I always ask three questions. What's one thing you like, one thing you don't like, and one thing that's new to you? And I would always, you know, poke and prod them. And eventually, if you like teaching a class, you sort of develop a rapport, right? Um, so you can kind of get away with things. But, you know, yeah, I know you hate it, but even though you hated it, what's one thing you liked about it? And force them to like reckon with that idea. And then I think for me, like there's a lot of music that I love now. I actually was gonna talk about this and then I left it out because I felt I was rambling a little bit. But, um, you know, there's plenty of music that I didn't like at one point. Like the first time I heard 12 tone music, I was like, this is nonsense and this is dumb. And then now I love it. And like Schoenberg is one of my favorite composers. Um, so I think just giving uh, students time, people time to sort of just repeated exposures to different types of new music is really important. And always, always the presentation. So my girlfriend is not a musician. Um, she's a nurse. And she has no experience in this world except for like the music that I've shown her or played for her or just have on in the house. And I'm continually sort of baffled by and impressed with the things she likes and the things she doesn't like. And it doesn't fall neatly into what we in the new music world would describe as accessible or inaccessible. Um, she, I played Schoenberg one day thinking she would hate it and she thought it was really cool. I played Steve Reich one day thinking she would love it and she did not care for it at all. And you know, that's kind of the opposite of what you'd expect. So I think just being open, um, being open in all aspects of it and both presenting it and letting people experience it as they will. One of the things I've kind of characterized um, music and one of the, I think most interesting parts of um, composers these days is I've characterized music making now as like a conversation. Um, you, if you write a piece of music and it, it could be the, uh, the most kind of a revolutionary piece imaginable, if nobody hears it, there's no conversation and it's, it's missing a huge part of its possibilities as a piece. Um, and I, one of the things that you said I thought was quite interesting was you spoke about um, listening as a conversation. You you are getting feedback on how other people will listen and enjoy music, and that's been really helpful to you. That's kind of uh, fascinating. Um, so that's not really a question. That's just more of an observation. Well, I think for me, like when I compose to like I've had a shift. Um, and actually, you, I think, you know, when we were together in England, um, I remember seeing you working like this back then, but like I'm much more inclined now to work with people with whom I have or can develop sort of like a longer relationship with. I'm thinking of like your guitar pieces yeah. and sort of how they developed over time. Um, I just got done just before the pandemic and everything, um, this duo, uh, the Bern Kozar duo, uh, they had taken a piece of mine on tour and I knew them a little bit, you know, we were kind of casually friends um, when they premiered the piece a year ago, almost over a year ago now. And they've since taken it, you know, they've played it six, seven, eight, nine times all across the country. They've really gotten into the piece. They've kind of, you know, they've really taken ownership of it and allowed it to grow within them. We figured out technical stuff like four performances in, like the third movement was never balanced right. Um, that was my fault. Uh, and we also developed like this really awesome friendship and you know that kind of like music as a catalyst and that way of working for me is way more satisfying you know that sort of that relationship building um, than kind of other ways that you work as a composer it's it's like um it's the sort of humanizing aspect of making music and one of the things i I think it's interesting about working like that is um, I, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this has been, this should be attributed to a minimalist composer, maybe Steve Reich or Philip Glass, but um, there's um, somebody said to me once that we never hear anything twice. We, we can hear the same thing over and over again, but we'll always hear it differently. So we, I guess, I, I mean, we can listen to the same thing over and over again, but we'll always hear it differently. And I think that's what's so re rewarding about those relationships where you build a really close relationship with one musician because they play your pieces a lot and you hear the pieces a lot and you really learn a lot about what you enjoy. And I think um, it's it's difficult for um, uh, students, actually, because students, uh, they want to try everything. They don't want to be stuck doing the same thing over and over again. But I think as I've um, got a little bit older, um, 
it's 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 become the most rewarding thing. It's working with somebody for months on end and just really learning about the piece you've made. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, because I thought it was curious, um, is about uh, notation. Uh, you sort of mentioned moving away from notation. Well, not necessarily moving away from notation, but you. I was wondering if you found notation stifling in some ways. Yeah, I think so. I don't know if I'd use the word stifling, but I find that the music I write changes whether I'm, or has changed, whether I'm focused on sort of dots on a paper per se versus sound in space. Um, you know, and I actually talk about this a lot when I'm teaching uh, young composers. Like there's an impulse that young composers have especially and as a slightly older composer, I still feel that pang from time to time, which is, you know, you want to show that you're clever. You want to show that you know all the notes and that you know all the rhythms and like, look at this septuplet and look at how smart I am. Right. And there's always a part of me that like wants to prove how smart I am. Again, probably just like insecurities I need to work through. But you know, when you're looking at paper, I think it's really easy to want to fill up all the blank space with as many black dots as you can. And what I found sort of the way I've been working more and more, um, sort of improvising into a DAW, I use, usually use Pro Tools or Ableton, depending on what it is I'm doing uh, or where the piece is at. But when I improvise in, my ideas are much simpler because I'm not focused on what they look like, I'm focused on what they sound like. Um, like I said, the first piece I really did that with was this piece called From Dreams We Emerge, and it just totally changed how I approached music. And there are just sections of the piece where nobody plays and there's just electronic resonance happening, which when I look at that on paper, I'm kind of like, I just got seven really awesome professional musicians to sit there for 30 seconds. Like, <laughs> Enjoy that paycheck, guys. Um, but you know, it's what the music calls for. And you know, I don't think, I know for sure I wouldn't be as comfortable doing that if I weren't listening, if I were just writing on the paper. Maybe there are other composers, you know, Feldman does it and you know, he doesn't, he didn't do much with electronics as far as I know, remember. You know, and his scores just have huge swaths of empty space. Um, but he was much more confident as a human than I am.